Hello and welcome to this video about the Occupiers Liability Act. This follows on from the other videos about the case law surrounding the 1957 and 1984 Acts and it's going to focus on longer scenario questions but remember the Occupiers Liability Acts can be examined in any part of the AQA A-level paper including a shorter question, a 5 or 10 mark which would focus in on one particular area, say for example the ability to blame an independent contractor under Section 24B of the 1957 Act. But today we're going to have a look at the longer scenario questions, which are questions 10 and 11. And I recommend you start with these questions when you're doing the final paper. And that you annotate the scenario and the question and read them at least twice before you start writing anything. Then you spend a few minutes, up to five minutes, planning your answer, 30 minutes writing it and five minutes to check it. If you spend 40 minutes on each scenario, then that will leave you um, a mark a minute for the rest of the questions. So here is a question from the 2016 specimen. And this is the question that we're going to have a look at today. So if you want to pause and have a look at it and annotate it yourself, then please do so. Note the format of this question is that the first part of the question is about occupies liability and the second part is an additional seven mark part of the question. So here is my annotations of this scenario. So I highlight the things that I think are particularly important. So I'm picking out things from the act as soon as I look at the scenario. And the way you know that you're going to be doing occupiers liability if it doesn't say um, is that it's going to be something to do with the premises, something's gone wrong with someone's house or garden, for example, rather than a um, straightforward negligent act like a driving incident, for example. So once you've decided it's occupier's liability, you go through and annotate. And this one, you will see I've picked out some of the preliminary issues like who is the occupier? What are the premises? Is there a trespasser? noted the age of the trespasser, looked at things like warning signs and discouragements and the state of the premises and noted that there is another visitor who seems to be a lawful visitor who's potentially also an expert and that the thin skull rule is going to come in at the end. And then consider that their first part about the rights and remedies of Carl and Leck against Jackson Limited in connection with the stack of crates is worth 23 marks and then the additional part is going to be worth seven marks and is about the options open to someone to pursue legal action if they don't have very much money. So this breaks down into three areas. The Occupiers Liability Act 1984 will apply uh, to Carl, the 57 Act will apply to Leck and then you've got the seven mark part to remember for Carl pursuing legal action. So when you're um, structuring an answer that has both of the acts in, you can deal with the four issues at the start together because they are the same for both acts. So you would include an introduction to say that you think Leck might have a claim under the 57 Act and Carl might have one under the 84 Act, and then explain that you're going to do the first four elements together. So an occupier, for the purposes of both acts, is someone who has control over the premises. It's not about whether they own it, it's about whether they control it. And so here, Jackson Limited, and you could abbreviate that to save time as well, because this is what we're trying to do, is to save time. Jackson Limited is the occupier, as they own the yard and have control, so they have control over it. The fact they own it isn't why they're the occupier, it's the fact that that means they have control. And they are the occupier, even though no one else is living there, which is like the council in Harris and Birkenhead. Next, you're going to look at lawful visitor. A lawful visitor is someone who has express or implied permission. Larry and Walker is the case about implied permission. Those with legal rights of entry and those with contractual rights. Leck is a lawful visitor as he's been invited to come and collect the crates here. But Carl is not a lawful visitor as he broke through the temporary repair to the fence to get inside. So he didn't have express or implied permission. So he is a trespasser. The third issue to deal with is what are the premises? 
and they are defined as any fixed or movable structure, including a vessel, vehicle or aircraft. And here the premises are the warehouse and yard, including the crates. And then lastly, the damage has to be caused by the state of the premises. And that's the same for both acts. But there's a difference here because Carl is messing around and jumping on the crates. So arguably there's nothing actually wrong with them. And it's similar to the fire escape in Keown and Coventry. And Carl has arguably not been hurt due to the state of the premises. Even if you think this is the case and that his case would fail here, you will carry on and do all the other elements. But making it clear, you understand that this could be a stumbling block for him. And then you'll say Lech has been injured because of the state of the premises as he was hurt by the crates falling on him. And Ogwe v Taylor is the case for the 57 Act. Um, and as all four elements will therefore be satisfied for Lech, J Limited will owe him a duty of care. So once you've dealt with the first four common elements, you need to focus on either the 57 Act or the 84 Act. I'm going to deal with the 57 Act and Lech first because I know there is a duty owed to him. So I'm going to start with what the duty is and under section 2.2, um, there are two reasonables in the duty, which is that the occupier, J Limited, must take reasonable care to see that the visitor will be reasonably safe using the premises for the purposes of their visit. And that's Laverton and Kiapasha takeaway. So the standard um, J Limited have to reach is that of a reasonable occupier. But this changes uh, if you have got children or experts in the scenario. And here we have got experts, so we don't need to worry about children. And this means that J Limited may owe a lower duty to LEC under section 23 little b because an occupier can expect an expert to appreciate and guard against any special risks ordinarily incident to his job, like the chimney sweeps in Rolls and Nathan. So this means that they should be aware of special risks that are related to the job that they are actually doing. And you can tell that you've got an expert in your scenario if they come in to do a job and they are hurt whilst they are doing it because the occupier should expect them to know better, really. So here, Lech could be considered to be an expert as he is a driver for a road haulage company and this sort of pile of crates becoming un unstable is a risk that he would expect when collecting them. So this may mean that J Limited is not liable to Lech. So the next part is to think about whether you need to do any risk factors um, or causation. Here I would suggest you need to mention the thin skull rule, but I, you could omit the other parts and it would not harm your answer. You have to be careful when you're doing the risk factors. So if you do them, you need to be careful. You don't say, oh, yes, harm is likely and could be serious without thinking about it. Because here, actually, if there is an expert involved, harm is not likely if you employ an expert to collect the crates and arguably any harm would not be expected to be serious. So they wouldn't be in breach of their lower duty here. Similarly, if they are in breach, so make sure you uh, follow it on logically, there wouldn't be any issues with factual or legal causation. And the fact that they had a pre-existing weakness would not affect potential liability because under the thin skull rule, once the type of loss is foreseeable, it doesn't matter if it caused an existing condition to get worse. And that's Smith and Leach brain. So the part of that that you do need to mention is the thin skull rule because that is specifically in the scenario. And then you would finish off your answer with a consideration of uh, any defences and the remedy. So if they are in breach, the remedy is damages, including death, personal injury, damage to property and any consequential damages. And you could, if you have time, mention that he could have any damages reduced uh, under the Law Reform Contribution Negligence Act 1945 if it's been um, considered that he contributed to his injuries by his actions. And that's Sayer and Harlow. So that would be the end of Leck, and then you'd need to move on to Carl and the 1984 Act. So importantly, we've just done the first four elements for Carl, but to even be owed a duty, a trespasser um, has to satisfy the first three elements in the 1984 Act. So the first one, little a, is the occupier is aware of the danger or has reasonable grounds to believe that it exists. And that's Bryant and Asbury Water Park where they weren't aware of any objects under the water. So here, J Limited is aware of danger generally in an industrial yard because they've put up a sign saying danger, but it's unclear whether they believe the stack of crates in particular were dangerous. As to little b, 
the occupier knows or has reasonable grounds to believe that a trespasser is in the vicinity of the danger. Here they do have reasonable grounds to believe a trespasser could be in the vicinity of the danger as a section of the fence has recently been vandalised and youths had come in and damaged property. So they were on notice, that means they knew, um, like the train surfing in Scott and associated ports. If you felt that they weren't aware and had no reason to believe that anyone had come in, then you could use the case of Swain here. And little c... Um, asks whether it's reasonable to expect the occupier to offer some protection to the trespasser. And this is um, Tomlinson and Congleton Council. And there are arguments that go both ways here. So you just need to have a sensible suggestion. So it might be reasonable to expect Jay Limited to offer protection to Carl as he's a child. And the warehouse and the yard might be considered to be an allurement to teenagers. They are a company, and so they may have resources um, to offer protection to him. But on the other hand, there's only so much that they're expected to do to safeguard irresponsible people against obvious dangers. And that is what the court said in Tomlinson. So you need to weigh it up. But don't forget that all you are doing here is saying that Jay Limited potentially owe a duty. You are not saying that Carl's claim will succeed because there are many other points at which his claim could fail. So even if you think that it would be reasonable for them to offer protection, then that only means that a duty is owed. And you have to bear in mind the history of the Occupiers Liability Act 1984 comes from uh, BRB in Harrington, where the court decided that there was a common duty of humanity to child trespassers and that social conditions had changed so much that they did need some protection against the um, dangers of um, factories, etc., and other dangers that occupiers might have. So decide whether you think there is um, a duty and whether those three elements, section 1, 3, A, B and C, are satisfied. And then whatever you say next has to conform with that. So... If there is a duty, so if you've said you weren't sure, then if there is a duty, then under section 1.4, it is to take such care as is reasonable in the circumstances of the case to see that the trespasser does not suffer injury on the premises by reason of the danger concerned. So you're taking reasonable care to see they don't suffer injury. And that is a lower duty than under the 57 Act. And not only is it a lower duty, so even if there is a duty, which is hard to prove because there are seven elements, is a lower duty, and then it can be discharged relatively easily under Section 1.5 by giving a warning or discouraging the trespasser. So here they had fenced the yard and placed a warning sign outside, um, although it was just a general danger side, sign, is it sufficient to give warning of the danger? That's all you have to do. Again, that is a lower standard than under the 57 Act. So arguably here the duty has been discharged. Lastly, you need to consider the remedy, if any, and any defences, because here, even if you decide that there is potentially a duty that has been breached the, um, and that there's no discouragement, then the defence would be that Carl either contributed to his damages and could have them reduced, or more likely the full defence, which would be a better defence to argue for J Limited that he consented by willingly accepting a risk, like the trespasser in Ratcliffe and McConnell. So in the unlikely event that his claim did succeed, his remedy for the broken arm would be damages. But remember, you can't claim for damage to property under the 84 Act. So that would be the end of the elements you would need to consider for Occupiers Liability 1984. So just finish with um, a couple of tips. Don't forget that you'd still need to answer the seven mark part of question 11. Um, you would need to know the material really well to be able to finish these questions in time. And as I said at the start, allow 40 minutes for the longer questions, the 30 mark questions 10 and 11. Only one of them has a seven mark part. Make sure you know the split between the issues and keep an eye on the time because it's really important to finish. So if you feel you're running out of time, then very quickly um, summarise the last few points and get them done.
and focus on what is relevant to the scenario. What are the important points? Don't just learn a whole structure about the act and repeat the whole thing because you won't have time to do that. So, for example, in the question we've just looked at, there was nothing about blaming an independent contractor under Section 24B, so you don't need to mention it at all. But clearly, if that was in there, then you would need to focus on it. And you need to get the correct balance between the assessment objectives as application and analysis is worth a lot more than just stating the law. And so you need to make sure that you are doing plenty of application, using the names of the people in the scenario, uh, saying here, quoting from the scenario, and posing alternative solutions to the issues that are raised. So saying on the one hand it could be argued this, but on the other it could be argued that. And that way you will have a very successful answer. So I hope that that's been helpful. Thank you.